but we, we'll get started anyway. Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to the MMS pre-party planning session. I'll be your host for arranging transportation at a party. No, this is, the, uh, this is listening to your guys is at v4.6 and 5.0, coexistence and migration. Um, I submitted a better title to the, to the conference organizers, and I don't think it made it into print. This is the real title. Real title is called, you can still tweet that. This is the sequel to the ever popular Tech Ed North America session where we covered the basics of that V5.0 and PowerShell. We're gonna do a lot of that same content, but we're gonna do it in the context of moving from an v 46 installation to an v 50 installation. Before we get started, I wanna say hello again. Hi, my name is George Matthews. I'm a program manager with the Windows Enterprise Client Team, and I have been with Microsoft and with AppV for five years, which means that I have worked on AppV 4.5, 4.6, and 5.0. And uh, I put my Twitter handle up here because as we all know, Twitter has shrunk all of human consciousness and the stream of thought into 140 characters or less. So if you wanna say hello, wish me well, make jokes about my bald spot, it's perfectly fine. And also for today's session, since we're gonna do a lot of stuff in PowerShell, uh, we encourage you to follow along. And to make it easier to follow along, we have a Twitter account. We have our very own at V PowerShell Twitter account. It's at at V PowerShell, right up there. You can read up there. And if you follow along with that, you're actually gonna see live tweeting from a lot of the commands we're actually gonna do today up on stage. So if you can't actually read, you can, you can still follow along, and if you need to uh, use those for reference later on, you can. ALA down front up here is your representative Twitterer, hoping that the internet does not give out today. So our next hour or so, we're gonna walk through, like I said, a whole migration through the AppV product. And if you're familiar with AppV, we're gonna start out with some of your old packages. We're gonna start out with 4.6 packages, we're gonna move those into 5.0. We're gonna finish off and show you some of the advanced features and advanced dynamic configuration utilities we've added. And we're gonna finalize all that by doing some PowerShell remote stuff and uh, AppV server and AppV client work. And we're gonna do a lot of this. Actually, we're gonna do all of this in PowerShell. It's MMS, we have to do it in PowerShell. So, raise your hand if you're an AppV 4.5 user. 4.6, 5.0, couple of you. We wanna make more of those hands come up for that last part of that question. How many, and since most of you know what it is, SoftGrid, SoftGrid is the original name for the AppV product. And we actually changed it because one of the questions we got a lot from our customers was, what's a SoftGrid? I don't actually know what it is. So we changed the name to application virtualization and we just shipped AppV 5.0. And this is our latest and really, in my opinion, our best release. And we added tons and tons of new features in here. We started out with this one concept that we wanted applications that are virtualized in AppV to work like native applications. And so in order to do that, we actually changed the file system. We're actually using NTFS. We're using the real file system behind your machine, which gives us really great performance on file system operations. We also use the same registry. We use real Windows API calls. So we let the application really take advantage of the performance of the host platform. We really let it integrate deeply with the Windows platform it's running on. We also gave you this new set of tools to put more apps into virtualization. So we have app connection groups, we have integrated com, we have lots of other features that really let you uh, make highly integrated applications available through AppV. And last, we have really great management tools. We actually started out with PowerShell. Guess which one I'm partial to. But we also have a really great web interface and we have one workflow now for setting up a VDI environment. And so if you're new to AppV 5.0, but you've been previously using AppV 4.6, you might recognize some of these bigger changes. You might already know about them. I'm gonna put them up on separate slides, at least the most applause worthy ones. So if you wanna cheer, it's fine. This is the Q drive. I love my Q drive. I've actually named my Q drive Bob because you can rename it. But uh, fortunately for you, and unfortunately for Bob, there is no more Q drive. Yay. Yes! See, that's the applause I'm looking for. Next up, we hear from a lot of customers that you had packages that were starting to get over that four gigabyte limit. And this stopped you from putting apps into that V. And again, that same idea, we want you to be able to put more apps in here. So this four gig file limit is gone. I don't want to admit how much time I spent on that animation. I really don't. So 
if you guys attended ALA's session yesterday, how many of you did? Raise your hands. Yeah, lots of you. If you didn't, it's okay. This is a slide that he showed yesterday. I'm repeating the same one here. These are key changes from at P4.6 and at P5.0. It's a big list up here. We're actually going to go through a lot of these during the course of the talk. So I'm not going to spend too much time talking about each one. And if you really want to learn more, you can always go visit the MDoc website and see a lot of these highlighted up there. So step one, let's actually get down to brass tacks. Let's start the migration. And so the first step in a migration is to bring your 4.6 packages and your existing packages, and a lot of you have these packages, right? You're like, most of you raise your hands that you're 4.6 customers, so you have a lot of packages you want to bring forward. And why sequence, which you can already keep. And so I'm going to give you a real high-level view of my demo, all my demos. We're going to start with this, and the very first process is to have your 4.6 packages deployed to your client. Well, a lot of you are already there, so you guys are basically done with step one. Well, step two, in AppV 5.0, we have a package converter. And a package converter converts your 4.6 packages to 5.0 packages. And we install this along with the AppV sequencer. I'll hold this slide up here for a moment so you can take a picture. So after that, you're going to move your AppV, your new AppV file format packages to the, your AppV server. Now, if you're an SCCM 2012 SP1 customer, you can also omit this step and move your packages directly to, oops, you can move them directly into SCCM 2012. But for the purposes of this demo, we're going to focus on the AppV server. If you're interested in learning about the SCCM 2012 integration, you can also check out one of the other sessions. I think it was presented on Tuesday, focusing on virtual applications and SCCM. And once you have these packages all sequenced, all set up on your servers, you're all ready to go. You have to make sure that your 4.6 clients, if you want to engage in coexistence, are up to service pack 2, which enables this. And then you're going to bring those packages right down to your 5.0 client, your IP 4.6 client. And these clients can coexist together on the same machine. And we're going to see that again today. So that's all my demos. I'm done. No, I'm just kidding. How many of you are looking at that and saying, that's going to take a while? That's going to be really hard and complex. I see the eyeballs rolling. So in 5.0, we've integrated PowerShell throughout the entire product. And PowerShell really lets you take advantage of this and really, really makes this a really simple process. And PowerShell is everywhere in the AppV 5.0 product. We have PowerShell commandlets across the client, across the sequencer, and across the server. And if you're familiar with PowerShell, raise your hand, because you've already seen all this. Perfect, you guys are already on board. For the rest of you, PowerShell is a technology we introduced in Windows Server 2008. It's an object-oriented scripting language. And what that means is that, as opposed to something like Python or Perl, which are really great languages, but they use strings to pass around data, PowerShell uses objects. And this is going to become really clear as we go through some of our demos. We're actually going to use these objects and pass around data with that. And PowerShell commandlets are always formed with a common syntax. PowerShell commands are always formed verb, noun. And the list of verbs that you can say in PowerShell is a limited set. There's a standardized set of verbs that we can use. And we've actually integrated and we've used all these in AppE 5.0. And so we're going to start out pretty small. We're going to start pretty basically. We're going to start with our AppV legacy packages. And we're going to start out with doing some package conversion. I don't know how that got in there. So let's start out. And while I'm getting my demo set up here, I have a confession. I've been moonlighting outside of Microsoft. I've been working at a company, you might have heard of it, called Contoso. No? Nothing? Well, Contoso is a really big AppV4.6 customer. And we have lots of packages. So let's start converting these, because I'm getting a lot of pressure to put these out today. So again, one of the great things in PowerShell is really integrated help. So we're going to start out with just get help. Well, that's a lot of stuff right there. And we don't really care about everything. We just want to look at some AppV commandlets. So you can filter help at any time and for any part of the product by saying get help AppV. And if I say get help AppV, look at that. Those are all the commands that are available for the sequencer and the package converter. I'm on my sequencer machine right now, so that makes a lot of sense. And since I see these commands are inside the package converter, I'm going to go ahead and import that module into my PowerShell command.
And I have a directory of a bunch of old packages already set up on my file server. So let's go take a look at that. And get child item, if you're familiar with this command blit, this is the equivalent of dir inside regular command prompt, so we're just gonna go ahead and take a look. So you can see I have a bunch of packages in here. I have Adobe Reader and Notepad and Orca. And uh, I'm gonna go ahead and make a, another, uh, another directory for my new packages. I've actually already created this, but I'm gonna put these direct, I'm gonna put this directory string into a variable. And you can tell it's a variable because it has the dollar sign in front of it. And I'm gonna run the converge, uh, conversion at v commandlet, so convert from at v legacy package. In this case, I'm specifying down here, you can see I'm specifying my Orca package. I'm gonna put it inside the new package directory. And actually I have a little bit of confession, I already did this, so just so it would go faster. But you can see how this would come up. So this would finish up, and we have our Orca package already finished up and sequenced. But uh, how many of you wanna run that command for every single package that you have for 4.6? No, no, you don't wanna do that. That's gonna take a while. So we're gonna use some of the advanced PowerShell scripting features to do this. So I'm gonna run dir, just like I said, it's an alias for get child on, just like we had before. I'm gonna pipe it to get member. And when you actually pipe this to get member, you see that pipe command right there, that takes the output of the first object and pushes it into the second. And get member gives you a list of all the things and the properties and the methods you can do on any one of these objects. And in this case, you can see this is a directory. So I have an array, a list of directories. Well, that's perfect because that's what the package converter takes in as input. So we're gonna go ahead and use a for each commandlet. Now for each, if you're familiar with that, actually you really can't really see that too well. Let me scroll up, ah, you can't see it. Oh well. For each takes the output of the first commandlet and runs a command on every single uh, object in that array. And so in this case, I'm gonna pipe the output of get child item, I'm gonna pipe that directly into for each object and run it in to convert from at p legacy package. Now you see this little guy right here, right? This is piped item. This is the item that came out of the first set of commandlets. I'm gonna specify the full name. And this is gonna run for every single object I have in there. This is going to start the conversion process. Pretty simple. Now, we could, we could wait for all that to be done. But how many of you wanna sit here and wait for all that? No. Well, you, 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 you wanna sit here and wait, you don't have to. So, one of the other things we can do is we can use a background job. Now, oops. Now, a background job is started by saying start job. And you can specify the script block. And this lets you specify a PowerShell command to go off and kick off and run in the background. So, oops. We're gonna do start job. And just like we had before, we're gonna specify a script block. I'm gonna just use completion here, and I'm gonna do get child item, pipe. Always helps. And that kicks off our job. So now we just kicked off the job to start converting all those packages over into our brand new FE file format. And we're done. We started. We're halfway there. Well, not really. We're almost halfway there. And so if you're following along on Twitter, you're following along at home, you might have seen those commands pop up on Twitter feed by now. If not, you can also take a look and run this again. This, or I'm just gonna run these commands by you just so you can see them. These are commands that we just ran. These are other ways to do this. Well, how many of you have run the package converter before? A Couple of you? If you run the package converter before, you might have seen that sometimes you actually get messages coming out of the package converter. It might warn you of certain things, or it might say that a certain package couldn't be converted. And so to kind of help you with this, I have like a little checklist. So, thing number one, this has to be a package that works on uh, at v4.5, so it has to be an at v4.5 and up package. Number two, it has to work on the FP4.6 sequencer and on the FP4.6 client. And number four, when you actually go to run it, if you're using a .NET application or using something that depends on the VC runtime, you gotta make sure those versions are matched on the client, so you can't, can't get around that. Now, sometimes you might have actually seen a couple of package converter messages that come up like this. Give you a second to read that. 
But it says that the package converter detected an app that was, has an OSD file and specified an operating system that wasn't supported in app v 5 And in a lot of cases, a lot of the errors are like this because they tell you how to fix it. They tell you right here that this package cannot be converted unless the target operating system restriction is removed from the OSD. So if you pulled that OSD restriction out, you will be able to go ahead and convert that package. And you might get these for a couple different kinds of errors and a couple different kinds of situations, and I put up a couple of the common ones right here. OSD scripts and OSD registry settings, we don't convert those. Main reason is that we can't really determine the intent of what you're trying to do with your script, so we don't want to carry that forward and then break your package when it actually got back down on the client. And next, we don't support converting your DSC configurations, and we have a new, file, uh, new feature in FE5.0 that supersedes that's called application connection groups. I'm gonna show these off in a little bit, but that's how you're gonna get around those particular things. Well, we don't always just have four, six packages that also convert. We also may wanna sequence new packages and bring new packages into our environment. And so for that, we're gonna use the sequencer. And in a couple cases, you may also want to resequence your original packages. And you might wanna do that if it didn't work in 4.6 or the conversion didn't complete successfully for a different reason, or if you wanna take advantage of the new extension points in FE5.0. And to give you an overview of these, this is going back to the idea that we really wanted to be tightly integrated and we wanted to provide an integrated platform to run with Windows. And so for that, we've actually integrated with a lot more extension points than we ever did in 4.6. We now support MIME handlers and URL protocols and software clients and app compatibilities. I can keep going on all these. And so to really show you this, I'm gonna go over here and we're gonna do a sequencer demo. But to start out, give you a refresher on the app sequencer commands we're about to see. The nouns that we support in the app sequencer are sequencer package and package accelerators. And if you're familiar with package accelerators, that's awesome. If not, this is a new feature that we added in app 4.6 that lets you take your packages and makes it much, much easier to rehydrate these and basically move these into app 5.0. Let's go over here to our sequencer. And just like we did before, we start everything with help. Just so you can always remember which commands we use and also so I can remember. And so in this case, we can go ahead and take a look at the sequencer. Sequencer lives there, but let's go take a look. And we're gonna create a new package. Oh wait, no we're not. We're gonna use PowerShell. And so the first thing we have to do is we're gonna set up a uh, installer that we wanna convert and an installer that we wanna sequence. In this case, I wanna sequence 7-zip. And the first thing we have is our virtual application directory. And I'm gonna put this into a variable. So we have app directory. And this is where the uh, package files are gonna go. Next up, just as before, we're gonna have our directory where we're gonna put the new packages once we're done. And then last, we have our 7-zip installer. So our installer is up here. And from there, we can construct a new app sequencer package using a PowerShell commandlet. So I'm gonna go ahead and kick that off, and it already exists, so I'm gonna make that go away by getting rid of it. Instead of that, we'll just move ahead. And when it's done, we will actually output a sequencer. Now what this commandlet would have done is this would have started the installer and kicked off the sequencing on that installed package. But you can see the output of that right here. And on top of that, we also have one more demo that I really wanted to show you, and this one's kind of a, a really cool one. If you have, for example, a set of four or six packages that you've run through your package converter, and you want to take these packages, and you actually still want to take advantage of the new extension points, but you don't want to go back and resequence them and build all those new packages again, you don't have to. We actually have a little trick. This is one of our 
my patented tricks for doing this. So just as before, we're gonna go into our demo content folder, and we're gonna go back and look at our, our packages, and we're gonna set up our variables just as we did before. But this time we're gonna run update at vSequencer package. Now I want you to see what I did here. Look where I put the installer path. The installer path is pointing to a blank batch file. And so this blank batch file lets us, uh, lets us take this, this package, and we're gonna run a new installer run. This installer doesn't actually have anything in it, it just starts command prompt. And so we actually run that, Again, that package is already there. I did my demos beforehand. <laughs> but these packages would have kicked off this installer, and the same idea would have applied before. You can use this exact commandlet to take these, to take these packages and move them up to app 50 And so just as a reference, these are all in the slides, so you can download these later and take a look at these. But these commandlets are the ones that I just showed. Now, how many of you saw a couple of files in there in that sequencer directory and that output of that 7-zip package and you saw a couple things in there and you said, what are these extra files? There's a couple files that we put out with a sequencing package. We put down an MSI, dynamic, uh, dynamic deployment configuration for the machine, and dynamic user configuration. And these are the ones we really wanna talk about because these are super, super cool. These are new features in app 5.0. And there's three things you need to know about uh, dynamic configuration. First one, it modifies the package's virtual environment. It doesn't require resequencing, and there's two types of files you can do. You can use a deployment configuration, which affects all the, uh, the package for every user on the machine, and you can deploy a user configuration, which only affects that particular user. And these packages, or these files, come free when you sequence a new package. We set these templates up for you, so you don't have to make a new one each time. You can actually just take these files and just modify it as you see fit. And so to do this, we're gonna use the client. And so the client has a couple nouns on it, and this is probably the most extensive of all the PowerShell commands you're gonna see. There's the app client package, an app client connection group, app publishing servers, virtual processes, configurations, and applications. So I'm gonna run through and I'm gonna show you this. Now, this client is actually a little bit special. You might see that it already has coexist in the title. And this is because it actually has app 6 already deployed on it. And to prove that to you, I wanna show you a brochure that I downloaded yesterday, because I, uh, I won big here in Vegas, so I'm actually gonna get a new car. And I've been looking at this, and you can see this is opening an app 4.6's uh, Adobe Reader. And this is a PDF file, just like we would normally expect. So we're gonna come back to this. So just like every other demo we've been doing, we're gonna start it with get help. And just as we've been doing before, we're gonna go and look inside a directory that already has a package. Now, I've already sequenced this version of Adobe Reader 11. You can see that I have the app fee file inside here, and I have a couple configuration files. Now, I have a couple also that I've already modified, and we're gonna take a look at these. And so just to show you how the package behaves by default, no configuration files applied to it, I'm gonna go ahead and add this to the client. Takes just a second. and I'm going to publish it. Now you can see what I did here. I actually took the output of that add at v client package command and I piped that into a variable that I called at, uh, package. And so I'm just gonna run publish on that same object. Again, these are all working directly with objects. And you can see out here that I got this at v, or this at v enabled Adobe Reader package. You can see the shortcut, it's actually pointing inside an at v virtual package. And we're just gonna stop it and get rid of it just so I can start showing you the configuration files that we have here. Let's take a look at the first one. So to give you an idea, what's in white is the original version of this dynamic configuration file. 
This is the default. The stuff in red is stuff that I'm removing with my new uh, customized deployment configuration file. And just to give you an outline of how these are arranged, we've commented out the different sections by default for you in each of these files, so you know where each of the elements live. So for example, shortcuts, file type associations, com, package scripts, lots of different things you can customize inside here. But we're gonna start by just taking out the shortcut. So you can see where this is pointing. This is pointing to the common desktop, to that Adobe Reader link that was left on my desktop the first time I published that package. So let's add this to the machine. And to make this command fit inside 140 characters, I have to use a little bit of PowerShell. So I'm gonna use a variable to hold the path of the package. And I'm gonna run add. All right, it's 155 characters, but still. And so this package is now published on the machine. And you can see that the, the uh, shortcut that was previously up here, that went away. And if I go ahead and launch that file, and I start that up, you actually see what's happening here. We're actually loading up this new version of Adobe Reader because we still have that file type association being published. So even though we don't have the shortcut, we've customized the package to allow us to have the file, uh, the file type association. Now, the first launch, whenever you do an app client package, is gonna be a little bit slower than the subsequent launches. And that's because we're streaming down all the bits of the package to bring that down onto the client and stage all those files and all those settings onto the machine. So I'm gonna go ahead and make this my default reader application. I'm gonna close that and just show you that the subsequent launches are super, super fast. You see how fast that was? I'm gonna do that again. It's really, really quick. And so we're gonna keep moving on here. Let's take that package, stop, unpublish, and remove it. This is the full sequence to get rid of any package on the machine. So you see what we're doing here? We're calling get, looking for that Adobe package, and it's gone. And let's take a look at a user configuration file. Now, these have about the same cons uh, construction as, default, uh, as dynamic uh, machine configuration files. And in this case, instead of chopping out a section of the file type associations, I'm actually gonna remove and disable the whole entire file type association uh, application uh, extension. So I'm gonna remove those, and I'm gonna add the AppV client package just as I did before. And this time, I'm gonna publish it. And notice how this time, because it's a user configuration, I'm applying that at publish time versus applying it at add time. So I had this package back out here. And this is launching in the original Adobe, uh, Adobe Reader that we had deployed with AppV 4.6. So we have no file type associations. Yet, at the same time, I go and double click on that shortcut and now you can see that we have the Adobe Reader that we had sequenced earlier. And this is our 5.0 version of that package. So we're gonna clean up everything. Just run stop on that. Now, you notice there You notice that we had two versions of AppV deployed on that, pack, on that machine. We had AppV 4.6 and AppV 5.0. And when we had those two packages deployed, you notice that one particular thing caught you. Those uh, extensions that we disabled and enabled during that demo, you notice how whenever we had the extension enabled in 5.0, we took over that and AppV 5.0 was the one that handled that extension. And we moved that extension back over and we took it out and disabled it. It went back to 4.6. And this lets you stage your migration. So this is really a great feature for you to be able to move, to move your, your packages from one version of AppV to another, since you can stage your migration in, in pieces. And so to really finalize and just finish all this off, we're gonna go back and we're actually gonna start doing commands on the server. So we're gonna start with AppV server packages and server connection groups. Now, let's take a look over here.
And so just to show you that we're actually starting with nothing, I have my server web app already loaded and up and running here. And you can see inside here, we have no packages. So we're starting with nothing. So we're gonna start out just as we did before. We're gonna run get help. And just to show you it's not a trick, we have no packages returned from the get app view server package. Now, inside my package directory, I have a separate drive. And this drive has all the packages. I've already copied all these ones that we've been converting and sequencing during the course of this whole demo. We've already moved these over into this new directory. Now, this is a virtual uh, pass-through directory on IIS. So if I go to HTTP app view server packages, I've actually turned on directory and listing. So you can see that all these packages are available through IIS on this machine. So you can see we see everything in there. And just like I showed you up here, we have our directory with all of our packages inside of it. And we're gonna use that as a root for all of our package import. Make sense so far? So far, yes. And just like we did when we were working with the app v package converter, we're gonna run a directory, and we're just gonna filter this down to just app v file. So you see I'm doing a wildcard dot app v. And I'm gonna pipe it into a for each object. I'm gonna run import app v server package. And I'm gonna combine the package root with the name of that package. Perfectly makes sense so far. Oh no. That didn't quite work. Why didn't that work? Well, if you look at, you look at the extension on here, this says that every single package has to have an app v file extension, which this kind of implies that the strings weren't actually getting merged together. They were just trying to push them together and it didn't quite work that way. Well, just like I was saying before, PowerShell is built on .NET. So you can bring in .NET commands and .NET uh, utilities into your app v PowerShell commands. So in this case, I'm actually gonna use a system IO path. Now this is a common utility you find in .NET, and I'm gonna import this into my command. So I'm gonna run a combine, which is gonna combine the original server root that I just specified, and we're gonna combine that with the name of the package. Now, because this is HTTP, we need to replace the spaces with percent %20, it's HTTP. And that's how we're actually gonna do our import. Now the import operation could take a moment just because it has a bunch of packages it goes through and it looks at all the metadata inside each one. So I'm gonna skip ahead here and cheat, just like a cooking show. To where we have all of our packages imported. And if we let that command finish, we would see that. Now how many of you are speed readers and picked up every single thing that you just saw there? You guys read all that, right? No, you didn't. And so one of the other PowerShell commands you can use to help out with this is format table. And this takes the output of a really big list of things and lets you format it so that you can actually read it in a much, much better view. Much, much nicer. So we can see we have nine packages up here. None of them are published. You can see the applications we have inside, entitlements, and none of them are part of connection groups. So we're gonna set up some entitlements. And in this case, I wanna give access to all of our domain users for all these packages. And just like we did on the package, on the package converter and on the client, we're gonna take the output of the first command and pipe it into grant app v server package. And this is gonna go through and contact Active Directory, get the security identifier for each one of those groups that I just specified, in this case just one, and it's gonna apply that to every single package I just specified in there. And again, like the other commands, because this is populating a database and contacting other machines, this can take a second. You can see my hard drive like flashing like crazy. And you can see the entitlement field for each one of these is now pointing to the security identifier for the all domain users group. And so for every one of these, just like we did before, we're gonna run publish. And we have all these applications that are now enabled and published. Much, much easier to see. Now, one of the features I talked about before is when I talked about dynamic suite configuration and it supersedes with connection groups. Now, connection groups are really easy to set up. 
they don't require any resequencing. You don't need to do any extra work when you're actually sequencing to set these up and really make these work. You could take two, any, pack, any two packages and move them into the same virtual environment. And in this case, we're gonna take Adobe and we're gonna take our Orca package and we're gonna make a connection group out of these. Now, you can name your connection groups in whatever you want. I'm picking a name for myself right here. Of course, you can pick whatever. And I'm gonna run set app server connection group, specifying our group that we just had from earlier. And I'm gonna point it to the package, uh, package list that we just generated. As you can see here, when I did that, I had our Adobe Reader 11 package and Orca. So when these actually get deployed on the client, these are going to have the same virtual environment. Now you can imagine that this would work for anything like Office plugins, which is what you saw yesterday, or Java, middleware, and any other application that depends on. This is really easy to set up. And so just like we did before, we're also gonna grant that uh, access to all of our domain users, and we're gonna publish that out. And we're done. Now, in order to make the load on the management server and the publishing server uh, reduced, we refresh the publishing servers by default every 10 minutes. You can get around this by running IIS reset, which is what we're gonna do right here because we just wanna speed things up. And the last thing we're gonna do, this is actually my favorite, is we're gonna use PowerShell Remote. So rather than adding each one of those packages, every single one of our clients and adding that publishing server to every single one of our clients. We're gonna remote in to each one of our clients and we're gonna add the packaging server using a remoting feature. Now, these already have remoting set up on them, but I just wanna show you how easy it is to actually enable PowerShell remoting. You just run enable PS remoting. This gets gonna tell me it's already enabled. And I'm gonna run this command. and we get a return from each one of the clients as they respond back to us. And I'm just gonna go back and actually show you this. We actually go back, with, since we've already logged in, we have our packages being published out. So this is one. I'll go back to my other client, which is actually not on that demo. Well, the other one's still waiting to come back. When we actually come back with these, we'll actually see that we have all these packages already pre-configured and ready for us, and these are streaming off of the same server that we've just set up a few moments ago. So we've set up an entire migration using the server, using the packaging converter, and using PowerShell remoting. And so, just to recap everything we just talked about, you guys have seen the new features in App 5 You saw how fast that Adobe Reader package launched, and you saw how quickly we were able to get new packages on the system, and you saw that streaming user experience that we were able to show right at that very end, that very nice looking progress bar right there. Your users are really gonna love App 5 The scripting support that we've been talking about, we really hope this makes your migration a lot easier. And if, again, if you have refer, uh, reference questions or you're a little bit confused, you can always take a look at our PowerShell account, App V PowerShell. And that has all the commands that we've been tweeting up here this morning, or this afternoon. And AppV4.6 and AppV5.0 work great together on the same machine. I showed you coexistence of an AppV4.6 package and an AppV5.0 package being intelligently took, taken over for their extension points. And if you run the problems or your package converter is not giving you the right answer or not giving you exactly what you expect, you can always use PowerShell error channels to help you resolve those issues. And so that's the end of my prepared content. I wanted to leave some time for questions at the very end. If you have questions, please feel free to come up to a mic and say hi. Thanks, George. That, that was great, actually. Uh, it was my favorite one of the week. I just want you to know that. Oh, thank you. Yep. I, I appreciate that deeply. Sure thing. But here's the tough you, part. You can have a candy <laughs> and a chocolate for that if I All remember right. where I put them. Well, we'll see how you do on the question, right? Okay.
So now I'm worried. Yeah, we, we just rolled uh, AppD5 to our Zen app servers this week. Okay. And now every published application, not just virtual application, any application, brings up the tray icon for AppV. For AppV 5.0? Yeah. And, That's fascinating. And when you close it, it doesn't close the AppV icon. So it uh, keeps the session open on all the servers. Well, my. Uh, <laughs> and my you, can't, you can't disable the tray icon in 5.0 either. Well, my. My psychic powers are, are failing me right now. I'm not right. entirely sure what's actually going on in that particular situation. Okay. Tell you what, if you stick around and you stay up here, yep. we can talk about that a little bit more detail and I can try and help you figure out what's actually going on. Okay. That sounds, like sounds a, good. Yeah. Like a the, of a problem. This one might be easier. I just uh, okay. was curious. I'll take the easy one too. If uh, in Visual Studio, will there ever be a way to compile directly into an AppV package? Not compile, uh, deploy into an AppV package? Deploy for, so build so instead of building an MSI, you build an AppV package. That'd be a super cool feature. Well, Flexera does it, so I didn't know if you know you were going to put it into Visual Studio. Tell you what, again, if you come up here, I'll okay. make sure that we actually get your email so we can cool. write that down and take that feedback in. That's a good deal. Thank you. Good piece of feedback. Thank you. Anyone else? Pop on up to the mic. Form a line. <coughs> Uh, you mentioned earlier that, uh, wow, sorry, <laughs> a little freaked out with the it's all right, it's all right. audio. Um, sorry, my question. Um, using deployment, um, the XML file to do deploy, com deployment configuration, that, in it, you're saying that changes the actual deployed application for all users? It, it, does, it, uh, it modifies the <coughs> virtual environment that it's running in. It doesn't actually change the application. It modifies the virtual environment. Well, if I can give you a little bit of a background, uh, we're dealing with Adobe CS6, and the licensing that we have to use has to run an XML file against the installed virtual application. Uh, there's a there's a recipe for 4.6 that says run this pre-launch script, mm -hmm. license it, and runs just fine. But in App V5, I've got to run figure out a way to run this script so that it licenses it. And I was trying to use a user config, and I'm thinking now deployment config. Uh, to, to do so. Sounds like it might be something that might be best suited for deployment uh, configuration. Tell you what, again, same thing. If you stick around at, uh, right after right after we finish up the questions, I'll try and take a better look at that, give you a better answer on that. Thank you. I do have one other question. Sure. Uh, web browsers, Internet Explorer, is there ever going to be any full integration where if I want to publish a plugin for IE, I don't have to have a separate icon for that plugin? I don't know if there's any plans for virtualizing IE. I well, I don't mean IE, but a way to uh, take over. When I click on an HTML link, it opens the real IE. But if I want to make a plugin for IE and I want to want to make that a virtual application, now I have to have a separate icon that says IE with plugin with X. Plugin X. Yes. Okay. We, Thank we've you. heard to, to reiterate. What I don't doubt you have. We, yeah, we've we've heard that request before. It's something that we're definitely looking at. Okay, thanks. Thank you. Back there. Or no, no, not back there. No. Bye. <laughs> Hello. Uh, my question's about the uh, migration and the user settings. When you migrate an existing package, deploy it to 5.0 if they have the 4.6 version of that same application, do the user settings get cut over to 5? So they will if you're using user experience virtualization, also available in your MDOP license. Yeah, but real, really. <laughs> so is that a no then if we're not? That is a no then if you're not. Okay, and that's why we're not going to 5.0. <laughs> Anyone else? No other questions? If you have any other questions. Yes? What was that? Sorry? You're bringing back the license, you want to bring back the licensing component? Yeah. The licensing and metering? I'm looking at Dilip down here. Those one of our test managers right down here, right down on my left. If you're really interested in some of the licensing features in there, you can check out SCCM 2012 with that V5 integration, which might help solve some of those problems. Hello there. 
In 4.6, you had... Um, you need to speak a little bit closer than a mic. Hello? Okay. Yes, now in, we can hear you. In 4.6, you had the uh, Q drive, which had the core cache, and then the user uh, portion of that cache would be in the user profile. Mm -hmm. Can you talk a little bit about how 5.0 actually reacts at a file system level? So, I can actually, I can do better than tell you. Or show us. I can show you. <laughs> So we have, pack we have two locations that you can put packages. If you put them in uh, globally published, they get stored in program data, Microsoft, App V, integration. And if you get user published, they get stored in local app data, which you can actually see here is inside my user profile. They go to Microsoft, App V, integration. You can actually see this, we're actually looking inside the Orca package right here. And in this case, I can open Orca directly from here. These executables are really inside. This is actually where we keep all the packages stored. So, does that answer your question? Yes. It does? Awesome. Any others? No others? Survey? Oh, wait, one more question. Yeah. So, uh, for globally published applications, if a user modifies a portion of that application is that is it then changed globally for all users on that device? When you say modifies a portion of an application, do you mean they change a setting? Yes. If they change a setting, their setting their settings are stored per user. Right? Okay, yeah. so their, still their settings are the settings are stored per user. The package is still cached globally for all the users of the machine. Okay. No, not, not in that global virtual bubble. They'd be sent in the, user, the user's app data directory. Any others? If you have any other questions and you didn't think of them in time to answer the mic, you can feel free to stick around. I'll be up here for a few minutes. I'll also be at the Q&A session afterwards. Thank you all very much for attending. I really appreciate it. If you had a survey that you were filling out and scribbling on at the very end, AJ is right there by the door. Hand those surveys to him. Thank you.